Good afternoon. I am uh, Dr. John Nordling at Concordia Theological Seminary, and it's my great privilege to uh, share with you uh, preachers um, the uh, collect of day of the day and then the text for proper 18a. So we're going to start by praying the collect, and then we'll go to the text, which is Matthew 18, 1 to 20. So let us pray. O God, from whom come all good proceeds, grant to us, your humble servants, your holy inspiration, that we may set our minds on the things that are right, and by your merciful guiding, accomplish them, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So that is going to be the collect of the day for proper 18. And uh, this is a collect uh, to God. Um, sometimes uh, we just had, at the time of my filming this, we just had Trinity Sunday, and before that was Pentecost. That particular collect was to the Spirit, but this one is to God. Usually when you see Hophaos in the New Testament, uh, it refers to God the Father, especially with the definite article. Um, so, O oh God, from whom come all good proceeds? Now, as I was uh, preparing uh, today, I didn't see any direct correspondences between uh, this collect and the lesson for today. I mean, maybe I overlooked something, but nevertheless, um, there's some things that come to mind that may bear upon this text in, in particular. First is that phrase, your humble servants. And this is one of my favorite uh, <laughs> uh, bandwagon things about how Christians, in fact, are servile um, as we serve God and we serve our fellow man in our vocations, and especially fellow Christians. But we uh, say your f that we are thy fellow servants. And this is, of course, the height of the season of Pentecost where uh, the season itself is about new life in Christ and growing as a disciple, as a servant of Christ. So maybe there's kind of a connection there because you'll see that the text for today is very, very practical. Um, then we have uh, that we may set our minds on the things that are right and that by your merciful guiding accomplish them. So it's a prayer. The things that are right I take to be uh, the texts, especially the gospel lesson that we're going to be focusing and you're going to be preaching on. These are the things that, that are right. Um, it's a kind of, a, <clears throat> of a, a prayer language for that. And that by your merciful guiding, that is through the pastor's preaching, uh, we may uh, uh, accomplish them. Okay, And we'll see how the end of this text seems to talk about prayer. And that might be the, the, the um, kind of the guiding principle for the whole thing. Um, okay, that's probably enough. Let's go now to the text itself. And we'll start at the top. Now, this text, as I discovered, is very, very long. So we might not get through it all. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about 15 minutes. And then I have um, instructed my cameraman to raise his hand and then when it when, when we get to 15 minutes, I'm going to try to get it done so that by 20 minutes we're completely done. That's my goal here. <laughs> so um, we have a, a, a text uh, from Matthew, Matthew 1, 18 to 20. And um, there are, part of the problem is that there are about five sermons in this text. And so I had a kind of a hard time as I was preparing. What, what kind of keeps these texts, these, these uh, pericopes together? And there are some. There are some repeated language that I have kind of diagrammed on what you're going to be seeing. But we start with the greatest in the kingdom. Then we go to the temptations to sin. Then we go to the parable of the lost sheep in the Matthew version. Then we go to a very Matthean uh, text, and that is the brother who sins, or Matthew 18, as we commonly say. 
And then we have kind of something, the, the last three verses kind of wraps it all together. But let's begin with how the text begins, and that's, that's the first opening verses. So we're just going to work through the text now. So in, uh, in Akene uh, Te Hora, so in that hour, um, the disciples approached uh, Jesus saying, and you know, this is one of the themes that we see in all of the synoptic gospels, um, who is the greatest in the kingdom? Okay, something that the, that the disciples are always very keen on answering. <laughs> and we know that they all want to show how great they are. And this is a common problem for all of us uh, pastors as well as lay people. We can show how great we are. So right now we can see kind of the, the, the repentance aspect of this text. So who then is greater in the kingdom of heaven? So we have this... En te basilea ton uranon, in the kingdom of heavens. Now, whenever we have kingdom language, there should be some flags that go up. Um, I did a little work on this today and discovered by looking at BDAG, one of my essential tools, that, it's an, that it is a Mathean phrase. And according to the editors of BDAG, there's no essential difference between the kingdom of heaven and it, notice it's in the plural, the dual, um, and the kingdom of God, or he basileia tu theu. So um, both are used fairly interchangeably in Matthew's gospel. And very helpfully in BDEG, they list uh, some of the occurrences. So I'm just going to say this, but uh, maybe you can jot it down if you're taking notes. This phrase, in the kingdom of heaven, is in Matthew 3, 2, Matthew 4, 17, Matthew 5, 3, and 10. That's, of course, a Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 19 to 20, and then it says, etc. So it occurs several other times. So it's a major theme in uh, at least Matthew's gospel. And Matthew, of course, influences, I believe, the synoptics as well. So you can see, and I put this in red, uh, in the kingdom of heavens here, then again we have, uh, he shall not enter into the kingdom of the heavens. See how stylized this language is? Then in verse 4, whoever therefore uh, shall uh, humble himself like this child, this one is the greater in the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Now, John, could you just scroll down kind of lightly till we see the red again, just so, so the people can see. Um, just, just scroll down, keep going, keep going. Right, so in verse 10, we have in the heavens and in the heavens, okay? I would, I would maintain that there's kind of a connection there. And then keep going, that there might be a little more. Um, uh, yeah, also in verse 14, uh, of my Father who is in the heaven. And I think that's pretty much it. Okay, now you can go back to the top again. Um, but it's, it's one of these phrases kind of connecting these disparate parts together, I would submit. Now, um, uh, so the way this begins is kind of in a humorous way, um, and having called... Having summoned, proskala summonos, a child, he set it in their midst. So they ask, who's the greatest in the kingdom? Jesus summons this little child and puts him right in the midst. That's, that's funny. That's how it's supposed to be funny. Okay, so <laughs> it works exactly opposite the way we think, where, you know, tall people, adult people, smart people, um, theological professors and stuff, these are thought to be the greatest in the kingdom, but no. Um, Jesus sets this wee child in their midst and as if to say, this one is the greatest in the kingdom. Okay? And he said, truly I say to you, verse 3, unless ye turn and become as the children or your children, Ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So those of you that have had me from Greek know 
that ume plus the aorist subjunctive is, is, is what? You remember from Greek? That is a SFN, a strong future negation. So it's a very, very uh, powerful way of saying it. Um, the turning and becoming like is, of course, um, uh, indicative of repentance. So it's not we can, something we can do by our own will, uh, reason or strength, but it happens to us, in spite of us even, uh, through our baptism, through repentance, through hearing the law, through uh, dwelling on this. You might want to do this in your sermon. Um, and we can't hear it too much. It's a common theme that we hear in all of the synoptics. But this side of heaven, we can't learn that too well. I still learn it and then forget it. Uh, okay, now, now I want to get rid of that. So, okay. Um, uh, and whoever, um, and now something else uh, in verse 5, and whoever receives one such one in my name receiveth me. Now I puzzled, I don't, I don't know exactly what that means. Who receives one such, but in my name makes me think of baptism, and especially how the Gospel of Matthew ends. Um, Go ye therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, uh, how does it go? In the name of, and then you have the, tr the, 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 the Trinitarian name of God. So uh, it, it's as if this is saying that uh, receives one such in my name, i.e. baptismally, receives me. I'm not quite sure how it works, but it's rather mysterious and I kind of like that. Um, as we baptize, we are, in a sense, receiving another little Christ that joins us, maybe, okay, uh, provisional with that. Now, um, okay, now that's kind of how it begins. Now I want to go all the way to the bottom, John, if you would please scroll down to me, for me. And um, uh, to, um, let's see, I don't know if I want... I think I'm going to start with, with uh, verse 18, and then um, it kind of, even though this is the, these are the paragraphs in Nestle Allon, they're a little different in UBS, but let's go through this quickly. Uh, Truly I say to you, as much as ye ask on earth, epitaskes will be given in heaven, and whatever ye loose, on earth, epitase gase again, shall be loosed in the sky, that is in heaven. So we have uh, the binding and loosing the promise. Um, what we have there, of course, is, uh, is um, uh, the, the office of the keys in confession. And here it is the second person plural as if this is given, of course, to, the, to all of the apostles, not just to Peter, or maybe you could even say that it's given to the congregation, this binding and loosing. Now, this should be seen, this promise should be seen in connection with, and I really don't because the margins are so narrow, I don't have a place to write this, but uh, Matthew 16, 19, um, there the promise of binding and loosing is given to an individual, namely to Peter. Okay, so our Catholic friends really go to town with that and say, see, the, the papacy does this. But uh, we Lutherans believe that Peter is the first of, of, of pastors. Okay, Peter sets the standard for the apostolic ministry, if we can talk about it. But this one is more um, for the congregation. Uh, and that's what the Lutheran Confessions say and what the Catechism says. When we uh, excommunicate people, this is a particular church power that the congregation has. So Jesus is talking about that power here. Um, notice uh, this recurring phrase, epitase gase, epitase gase, and then epitase gase in verse 19, makes us think very much of the Lord's Prayer. Um, uh, um, where, where it occurs uh, once again. Uh, so the, the, the power of binding and loosing, again, truly I say to you, 
that if um, if that if two agree of you on earth concerning any matter, okay, pontos pragmatos, uh, whichever ye ask for, uh, it shall be to them from my Father who is in heaven. Or this is you know this this dative here. Um, it shall be to them, they shall have it. You know, if it's a possessive dative, they shall have it from my Father who is in heaven. For uh, where two or three have been gathered into my name, there I am, a me, in the midst of them. So it ends, this, this passage ends with this tremendous promise. Are we already at 15 minutes? No. Really? Okay, I got to hurry up. But what you have here is the, is the idea of prayer, um, praying together uh, uh, in, in everything. That would take us back, of course, to the Lord's Prayer in Matthew's Gospel. And then um, this uh, statement that wherever two or three are gathered, so no matter how small or how weak the congregation looks, we have this uh, uh, incredible promise from uh, Christ, and this goes again to the end of Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew 28, where Jesus says, in 28:19, uh, um, and behold, I am with you all the days until the consummation of the age. Okay, so it's 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 a kind of looks ahead to that final. So there's lots of good gospel here. Okay, now let's go back and very quickly touch on the other parts. Like I said, you can preach on this text all week long because there's so much. Now the next part, the UBS refers to this as um, the, um, here we go, the temptations to sin. And I have put the the scandalizo and scandalon, um, a, uh, uh, um, a stumbling block. Whoever uh, causes one of these uh, little ones who believe in me to sin, it is better for him that a, a mill donkey stone be tied around his neck and he be plunged into the depth of the sea. Okay, that statement. So, um, um, temptations to sin are extremely serious for uh, those that are in the, in the, in the blessed communion. And um, that's what this is about. It's a very practical text. All of these have to do it, and there's tremendous law in this particular, in these verses it talks about um, you know, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, if your hand or foot. Uh, and something else is this uh, recurring phrase, be cast into the fire eternal, or at the end, be cast into the hell of fire. Okay, so you've got uh, images of eternal damnation there. One thing that kind of overcomes this frightful image is the idea of Jesus himself who on the cross, of course, is cast off from the fire. He, he becomes the one that's cast away for each of us sinners. And, 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 his, uh, and his death on the cross absorbs all of our scandala, all of our uh, stumbling blocks. So that could work very well for that idea. Okay, the next, I, the next uh, bit, go down to verse 10 and following. Like I said, we're not going to get through all of this. This is just a short bit. Um, beware lest ye despise one of these uh, little ones. For I say to you that the angels, that their angels in heaven um, always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now, one of the things, I guess you're kind of tempted to think that when when the gospel is talking about these lesser ones, these little ones, it's talking about children, okay? But 
I'm not sure that it is children. I think it could be talking about those that believe in me, the little ones that believe in me, those, i.e., who are simple, who have humble faith. That would, of course, include all of us, all of us who have been um, brought to repentance by the law. We are the little ones. That would, of course, include children, but also very strong and powerful people, well-moneyed people who nevertheless uh, despair of themselves and have faith in the gospel. And you will have the privilege of sharing the gospel with many people like that. So um, uh, it's, again, talking about uh, preserving the faith of your brother or sister in Christ. And not uh, the devil uses that. Uh, to tempt people to sin and, and hopefully to unbelief. And um, so in Christ, we have the responsibility to care for our, our you know, horizontal relationships, and we have the power in Christ, in the gospel, which we're privileged to have. That's basically how it works. Now, um, uh, then we have the next uh, verses 12 and following. Um, uh, the parable of the lost sheep. This is again uh, picked up in Luke's gospel. And I'm not sure that we need to spend too much time on this. Um, you know, um, I, I think it's talking especially about pastors who care for the 99 and then the one that wanders away and that we care for the one that wanders away because that's what it says. Um, uh, in verse 13, and if it happens that he finds it, truly I say to you that he rejoices over it more than a, 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 for the 99 who have not wandered. Okay, so there's an especial joy in heaven. And in the Lucan parallel, which is Luke, uh, what is it, 15, is it? Um, we have this idea of joy where the where the shepherd puts the, puts the lamb on his shoulders, an image that is taken up into the catacombs and whatnot. Matthew doesn't go that far, but Luke does. But it shows the great joy in heaven. And then it goes on that uh, uh, thus, um, uh, it is not the will before your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones be lost, okay? And this idea of the thelema, the to thelema, the will, thy will be done in the Lord's Prayer. And that, of course, picks up also 1 Timothy 2.4, uh, the will of God, whose will is that all men uh, uh, repent and be brought to a knowledge of the truth. Okay, that's what God's will is. Um, and finally... Um, uh, Matthew 18, go down a little bit further, scroll down. I'm going to have to go on a little bit further just because there's so much today. Um, so if your uh, brother sin against you, go and reprove him between you and him alone. And you know this already. I mean, what Christian doesn't know this? Um, it's congregational discipline. Uh, many congregations talk about this in their constitution that we take steps, you know, you and him, then with two or three others, then tell it to the church. And only then uh, let him be to you as a Gentile and a, and a tax collector. Um, and then we have this, this binding and loosing given to the, to the church, that is to the plural people of God in congregation, as it were. were. Um, um, what can we say there? Um, it's a Matthean phrase, um, and uh, one thing I found kind of ironic is um, this phrase, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector, and you know Matthew may well have been a tax collector, and if so, this could be highly ironic, where he's talking about himself and his, before he repented and became a, 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 a an apostle. Um, uh, this phrase from, uh, he's quoting, in order that at the mouth of two witnesses or three, every matter should stand. That is from uh, Deuteronomy 19.15. I looked that up, and that has to do with instructions given to the Israelites 
as they're going to enter the land and how everything has to be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses, um, especially if, if one Israelite is hailed up on charges before a court. It's not just one man. It can't be, Trump can't be condemned just by James Comey, but it's going to take other people like the tapes or whatever. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's how it was in the church and in Israel before that. And earlier, it, it, like back in Deuteronomy 17, I believe it is, it talks about how a man can't be killed unless there are more than just one uh, contrary, it takes two or three witnesses. So that's the context for this Old Testament passage. Now, I've had to rush, and I'm very sorry, but there, you can see that there's a lot of wonderful um, gospel and a lot of lumber here. Um, I think what I would do is I would, if I were preaching, especially if this is the first time you're through this text, um, I would go to the end and use the final part and then use the rest of it kind of as lumber because there's a lot of good lumber to use here, and use the recurring phrases which kind of unite this text. But uh, you'll have great joy and delight in preaching this passage before your people. And may God bless you as you do. Thank you.